How did you how did you get involved in Virgin? Did you just get a letter one day saying we want a Doctor Who story from you? No, no, no. So I was editing, I was no, I was not editing Doctor Who magazine. I was doing a feature for Doctor Who magazine. Freeman, John Freeman commissioned me. And so I went to interview Peter Darvel Evans when the new adventures were being set up. Um, and he was telling me about how he employed Paul Cornell to write this book and he was gonna open up the floodgates and he wanted to find writers who had not written before. And of course, I was thinking, yeah, this is great, opening up to new writers. Of course, the other alternative that is people like that are dead cheap. Um, so Peter's not a stupid man. So he was he wanted to open up, he wanted new writers because also we would be a lot cheaper or they'd be a lot cheaper. So anyway, I did this interview with him and I went, I didn't think anything more of it. And then I was sitting at home talking to my other half actually about that. And he said, well, why don't you write one? And I was like, to be stupid, I'm not gonna write a Doctor Who novel. That would be absolutely stupid. Hmm. So I went away, <laughs> I just put together, this is before I started working at Doctor Who magazine as an editor, I put together this synopsis for a thing called Legacy of Peladon, which had started life as an audiovisuals adventure that we never made. Uh -huh. um, and I said, I submitted it just onto the slush pile. I never said to Peter, I'm the person that interviewed you from Doctor Who magazine. I just sent it in and thought nothing more of it. Then I went to work for Doctor Who magazine as the editor. Um, and then I was at a convention in Bournemouth, I think. And Peter was one of the guests there. And there was me and Justin Richards uh, and a couple of other people. And we were in the green room and somebody in the green room said to Peter Darvel Evans, how do I get to write a Doctor Who novel? And Peter said, oh, well, you know, you have to do this and this and this and this and this. Um, and then they said, oh, you know, what's coming up soon? And he was going, well, you know, Justin here, as you know, is, is, is writing Theatre of War, and that's going to be coming out in a few months. And then Gary's writing this thing called Legacy. Um, and I'm standing there going, what? And anyway, this, this chap walked off and I went to Peter and said, excuse me? And Peter said, we thought it was odd that you hadn't replied to our letter. And I was like, oh, what letter? And Peter went, yeah, something's gone wrong here, hasn't it? He said, no, we want to commission you to write Legacy. And I was like, and that's how I got found out that I'd been commissioned for this book because the letter asking me to do it got lost. And I genuinely don't know that if we hadn't been at that convention and Peter had said that and I'd gone, what? It might never have happened because he might well have just sat in the office, of course, and thought, oh, he doesn't bloody want to do it. So we'll ignore oh. him and we'll commission the next person that comes along. And, and that's how I got into Virgin, work, working for Virgin. And I did Legacy and they seemed to quite like it. Um, and I didn't enjoy writing the new adventure style of books. I enjoyed writing Legacy a lot. As you can tell, it doesn't fit in with all the other new adventures in any way, shape or form. Um, and so when they announced they were gonna do the missing adventures, I went, that's me, that's writing past Doctors, that's writing a Doctor Who story that can fit in between televised Doctor Who. That's what I wanna write. So I did a Troughton one and then I did Scales of Injustice. And while I was writing Scales of Injustice, I, uh, I had been kicked out of Marvel. I was doing a computer game thing that I was writing for the BBC called Destiny of the Doctors. I was working with someone there. The producer there was a guy called Andy Russell, who is no relation to me at all. The TV movie was announced. BBC Books decided that they needed to do a novelization. There was this big meeting at BBC Worldwide. Somebody at BBC Books said, oh, we need to find someone to write this novelization. And this guy, Andy Russell, who just worked with me on this computer game said, oh, well, I'm working with Gary Russell and he might be quite good for your novelization. And I was, at that point, I was doing a day job working for a computer games magazine and the phone rang and I answered it. And this lady said, hi, my name is Rona Selby. I work for BBC Books. Would you be interested in novelizing the Paul McGann TV movie? to which I literally, that was the amount of pause I left. And I went, yes, thinking, <laughs> how? Surely, I, we've all known this movie's happening, but it's bound to be, what, why aren't they asking Terrence Dix? Why aren't they asking Paul Cornell? There are 10,000 authors better than me that they could ask 
why have they come to me? All of that went through my head in a split second. And then I just went, yes, of course. So I went and had a meeting with them and they offered me the job properly. And boom, Bob's your uncle. I was doing a Virgin book at the same time as I was doing the TV movie. I think Virgin might have been a little bit annoyed with me. Um, and then, of course, Virgin lost the licence. The BBC then started their Doctor Who books. I'd done the novelization, so I was kind of sitting there front and centre going, I would quite like to do some more of your... I'd like to do other missing adventures. Can I do the first meeting of Colin Baker and Bonnie Langford, please? Boom, that was commissioned. And so I carried on writing books, you know, they're not. Wonderful. Now, um, you did some work on the animations of the uh, missing episodes. Yes. So how... how that? Did you enjoy that? Some, <laughs> somehow, I think I know the answer. <laughs> I enjoy everything. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of hard work on a very low budget. Um, I, my, I'd done a lot of animation by that point. I'd, I'd gone to Australia to do an animated series. I'd, done, I'd worked on the two David Tennant animations. Um, so I knew a little bit, not as much as I probably should know, but I knew quite a bit about animation. So by the time the offer came through from BBC Worldwide. They decided to, after Power of the Daleks, they decided they wanted to have this six story rebirth of the animations. And would I do three of them and someone else was doing the other three? Um, I mean, not quite how it's put to me, but that's how it ended up. Uh, I, all I could think was, I know animation well enough to know the money you're talking about ain't gonna, it's just not possible. It's impossible. Ah, So there were lots of conversations about money, um, which Jason Hay Gallery is always very good at having conversations about money. And we got them to up the budget considerably. Uh, and then we were commissioned initially, no, we weren't commissioned, sorry. We were asked to do the Macro Terror. Uh, and we did about, just in terms of, pre-production, nothing to do with animation, pre-production on it. I did about three weeks work on that. And then they phoned up and said, actually, we're going to give the other team the Macro Terra. Uh, would you do this story? And I went, yes. And I did another three weeks work of uh, work on that, which never went anywhere. And then they said, actually, what we'd like you to do is view from the deep. And Jason was like, oh, yes, brilliant. <laughs> sat there and thought, Hmm, interesting. The missing story that, for whatever reason, every single Doctor Who fan in the world thinks is the greatest Doctor Who story of all time. Everyone wants to see it. Everyone loves it. And it's going to be the first animation you're asking us to do. Couldn't you ask us to do Galaxy 4, which, if it goes wrong, doesn't really matter. <laughs> but no, you want us to do the big one that everyone's in love with. And that's why we did Fury from the Deep. Um, and then we did Galaxy 4, and then we did The Bonneville Snowmen, and we did Web of Fear, Missing Episode. Um, and, yeah, it was lovely. But you're always battling with 2D animation, hand-drawn, frame-by-frame animation, which is my background. Um, how can I put this? When I was working in Australia, the show I was working on in Australia, the budget for one episode of that, which is 2D hand-drawn frame-by-frame animation, the budget for one episode of that was more than six episodes of Fury from the Deep. Wow. And the budget that I had in Australia also wasn't entirely realistic. It was still way under what it should have been. Animation is very, very expensive to do. And I don't think people realize Therefore, lots of people will complain about the animations and go, oh, it doesn't look like, you know, something they, it doesn't look like something we've just seen on television. Well, of course it doesn't, because what you've just seen on a television animated show, the first 30 seconds of that would pay for the whole of Fury from the Deep. You know, so we're working on, on a ridiculously simple budget because that's all the BBC could afford. Um, and that's fair enough. But that's why the animations were done in the way they were done. They, they had to be produced to the best we could do within the confines of, of the money you're given and, and the time you're given as well. You know, you think about something like Food from the Deep, which is six episodes. Um, and then you compare that to, let's say, 
a classic Disney movie, hand drawn frame by frame. So let's look at say, I don't want to go back to the forties. Let's look at the rescuers, right? That's hand drawn 2D animation. It lasts, I think it's about one hour, 15 minutes, which is three episodes of Proof of the Deep pretty much. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about budgets, but the rescuers took two and a half years to do 90 minutes or just under 90 minutes. Well, <laughs> we're doing twice that length on a oomph of the budget uh, in the original plan was we do it in six months. We didn't, we did it in just over a year. But you know, it's that kind of thing. You're just fighting against that the whole time. Um, okay. But it doesn't really matter because it's fun, you know, and it's great right. and you're animating Doctor Who and, you know, one, 50% of the audience loved it. 70%, 30% uh, of the audience thought it was all right. 20% of the audience think it's the worst thing in the world and I should be nailed to a cross and hung, drawn and quartered, um, which is pretty much standard for Doctor Who fandom on most right. <laughs> So, you know, it doesn't really matter. And I, I, unfortunately, for the people that hate these kinds of things, I am utterly impervious to criticism. Uh, because when Legacy came out, my first new adventure, it was ripped to shreds. And I survived that. And I realised if I could survive that, I can survive anything. So ever since that happened, criticism, I will learn from it when people make criticism that's valid. But mm. people say this is a pile of old rubbish and these people should be fired. <laughs> oh well that's what you think is it that's that's very smart and intelligent of you uh so i don't care about the criticism because i can't change it i was right. taught very early on by a magazine editor i worked with and it was a very good bit of advice i remember something had been printed wrong in this magazine he worked on and he'd had letters complaining about it and he said yeah all i can do is learn he said what do they expect me to do reprint the magazine with that thing corrected that's not how the world works. You All you can do is acknowledge the criticism and say, yeah, we'll try not to do it again. You can't afford to sit down and punish yourself for getting it wrong in the first place. And I've always had that in the back of my mind as a very good piece of, of rationale for anything that happens in life, whether it's work or anything, is if something's gone wrong or something is unliked, someone doesn't like something, all you can do is acknowledge that they don't like it. You can't change it. You can't say, oh, right, oh, you're quite right. I'll go back and reanimate all six episodes of Fruit in the Deep to suit you. Right. You're one person or you're 10 people out of 20,000 that bought this thing, you know? Um, so my, my philosophy has always been generally, yeah, you, you're right. That may be not how you wanted it done or that might have been a mistake or that might be a typo or whatever in anything I'm working in. But I can't change it. So all I can do is acknowledge that you don't like it or you found that fault or whatever and move on okay and i think there's a there's a there's a there's a weird thing in in doctor who fandom that a lot of people want to tell you that something is wrong it's not wrong they just don't like it but they want you to know that and somehow they want you to do something about it and you think I don't <laughs> what you want me to do about it uh, cuz i certainly can't turn around to the bbc so i'm terribly sorry can you wipe the whole of that uh and <laughs> animation we're going to draw it again over the weekend because fred blogs over there doesn't like you know the, <laughs> that character blinked at that point and that's all you know criticism is criticism and you listen to it and you acknowledge it and you smile sweetly but if there's something if you can't do anything if you can't change anything then there's no point in in having sleepless nights over it and people that get so worked up that they want to keep telling you how rubbish you are at something. All I'm thinking is you're telling the wrong person because <laughs> you're not upsetting me in any way, shape or form, because there's nothing I can do about it. And you that's know, what I'm about criticism. You know, it, it's like you can learn from it. You can listen to it. You can acknowledge it. You can't change it. You know, I was going to ask you, do you read reviews and how do you deal with criticism? And then well, you, I, you I have, you've nailed it. it. 
the more <laughs> negative the reviews are, the happier am I. When I first started <laughs> writing my Doctor Who books back in the 90s, I had a website. Uh, and all the website was, I didn't ever print the nice reviews. I always made a point of reprinting segments from the critical reviews, the ones that slagged everything off. Because mm -hmm. to me, that's far more fun. Well, who wants to put a website of Gary Russell and go, oh, Gary Russell's this brilliant writer who does that. If Gary Russell's going to have a website, it's going to say, Gary Russell's the worst writer in the history of the world. I'm like, yeah, that's what I want on my website. <laughs> there you it's go. just my philosophy of life. That's just the way I am. I'm, I'm not, I, I don't cry over other people spill milk okay very good now um touching on the animation episodes for the last time today we're, we're almost done here thank you for hanging in there um if bbc I, it was my understanding that bbc america was partially funding the animations or something like that yeah, I, don't I, think, know. I never really got into that side of it because i don't deal with money you know i spend okay. money i'm very good at spending other people's money <laughs> i try not to work out where their money is coming from because then i might feel guilty Okay. Now, well, if uh, BBC proper uh, were to decide to bring back more of the missing episodes in the future, such as, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, Marco Polo, um, if they were to do something like that um, and they asked you to be involved, you would say yes, correct? I want to say no, but I know deep down I'd say yes. Um, okay. <laughs> of course I would, you know, it's right. plain to me ego. Um, it, it's, it was the three years I spent on those animations. It's more than three years in the end, isn't it? Four years nearly. Um, they were exhausting. They were time consuming. I was working seven days a week, probably eight or nine hours a day. I had no breaks, no holidays. Most of my friends thought I was dead. Um, <laughs> there was an intensive non-stop rolling thing you know we we were working on galaxy four before we'd finished fear from the deep we were working on the abominable snowman before we'd finished galaxy four there was no let up there was no break so on those budgets on those time scales yeah i probably would go back but i really would force myself to sit and think hang on a minute do you want to put yourself through this? And that's not to be negative about any of the people I work with, particularly at the BBC, because Russell Minton is the greatest human being on the earth, I think, at the moment. I think he's wonderful to work with. It is the budgets, it is the time scale, and it is just that, as a fan, it's that dichotomy of what you want to achieve versus what you can achieve. Um, I'm quite happy. I, I think I'd be happier if someone said, we don't want you to produce this. Uh, just be a bit of a consultant. Just, you know, look at it every so often and go, well, I'm not sure. Have you thought about doing this or this? I don't know. No, I'm sure if they turn around to me and said, do you want to do Dalek's Master Plan? I'd be there tomorrow. Do you want to do Marco Polo? Of course I'll be yeah. there. You know, all of that sort of stuff. Because um, I'm an idiot. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm an egotist. And if somebody wants me to do something, then yes, of course I'll do it. But I, I genuinely would sit down and think about it for more than the half a second that i tended to think about other things i've said yes to okay very good now getting getting to closing here moving up to 2005 were you watching rose live when it came back on yeah oh yeah well, um i went round to uh my friend uh jim sanctuary and paul condon's house to watch it um i loved it i thought it was great it was everything i would want from a reboot of doctor who i had okay. no idea what I on it wonderful now um last question about audios today um of the i believe 233 audios that you've been involved in um some people say uh according to ratings that one of their favorites is uh the audio spare parts from big finish um do you recall working on on spare parts and would you agree with other fans saying that that's one of the best big finish audios ever? It's one of the best ones that I'm credited as producer on. Yes. No two ways okay. about it. It's wonderful. It's a great script. Great script, great acting. You know, all I did was commission the thing and direct it. But, you know, it, it, it it's everyone else it did it so brilliantly. It also has one of the best covers. Um, mm -hmm. I can't ever compare the eight years I spent at Big Finish 
with everything that's happened from 2000, late 2006 to date with Big Finish because I don't listen to them. Mm -hmm. Because one of the worst aspects of fandom is everyone wants to compare, everyone wants to write lists of best and worsts, and everyone wants you to say what I do is better than that, what that person does. And knowing that about fandom, I made a conscious decision when I left Big Finish and Nick took over to go, best thing I can do is not listen to them because then I can never be asked to say what I think of them, to get involved in anyone that wants to compare them. They're, you know, I don't know is the answer to that. So I can tell you, yes, absolutely. I think Spare Parts is one of the very best big finishes that I produced. Is it one of the best big finishes of all time? I have no idea because there's 20 years of Nick okay. Briggs versus 28 years of me and I haven't listened to him. Gotcha. Okay. That make, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Um, now, if going going back to the uh, the wilderness years and of course the 1996 movie and then the reboot, which began in uh, 2004 and then came back uh, in 2005, um, during that wilderness era, era was the audio visuals and then the beginning of big finish now there are the audio visuals were not really in the wilderness era at all though the, oh that's the, right audio it visuals finished by 1991 and really they'd finished by now i think we released one in 1991 we pretty much we ended at the same time the series ended. we so well, actually we ended when the virgin books were announced I don't okay think they'd be so yeah okay. i wouldn't consider audio visuals part of the wilderness years at all they were they were an 80s thing really gotcha okay now i've heard many people say that they believe big finish and the people that began big finish are responsible for saving doctor who do you do you believe that and are you one of those people well i can't answer that can i <laughs> Um, yes, <laughs> I'm one of the I created Big Finish with Jason. Now, the, we, we were the two people that set Big Finish up. Boom. Are we responsible for saving Doctor Who? No. Um, I think the only thing Big Finish did, uh, which I suppose, if you want to blame someone, is my fault because I was in charge of all the stories, um, is I think Big Finish as a concept, as a, as a, as a, production company whatever i think we showed the bbc not consciously we didn't know any of this was happening i think our existence and the reaction to the big finish stuff showed the bbc at the point where russell was trying to say to them let's relaunch doctor who that there was a huge interest in doctor who still out there for new stuff they didn't want to keep regurgitating just every vhs and put it on dvd oh look this company is doing brand new doctor who don't forget bbc books themselves are doing a, two doctor who novels a month as well so there's that audience as well it wasn't just big finish um but i know russell has said in the past that that big finish is one of the things he he cited to to the high ups at the bbc and said look these people are proving that there is still a huge interest in market for new doctor who rather than just rehashing the old stuff um i i think it's it's insane to say that we saved doctor who um i think it's fair and just to say that we were one of the things that was used to prove to the bbc that doctor who was an ongoing concern uh and there was still a market for it okay okay very good um every single artist or uh performer of any type that I have ever interviewed have one thing in common and that's called rejection where something that you're working on um, just doesn't work out for whatever reason. Um, you may believe it to be the best thing ever in the world and it, it just ends up not happening. Have you ever encountered a situation like that? And if so, how did you deal with it? Um, I'm spoiled in the sense that if we start if we look at it from the point of view of starting with legacy my first book was accepted so i've only had rejections subsequent to that which meant that unlike most hard working writers i never <laughs> my rejections came after my first acceptance so i never really struggled with the rejection 
I had plenty of it. I mean, in the sense of, you know, oh, here's a great idea for a Doctor Who novel. No, it's not. Go away. Shut up, Gary. Oh, so I just go, well, here's another great idea for a Doctor Who novel. No, it isn't. Come back with another one. Oh, oh right. That one is great. Good. We'll, we'll do that one. I never really have suffered hugely that feeling of, oh, my God, everyone keeps rejecting everything I did do. I, I'm, utterly, I'm like a spoiled child in that one. Um, in that I was just incredibly fortunate and lucky that my first idea got accepted. So I don't feel that I've earned the right to say, oh, yes, I've suffered tons of rejection. Things have been rejected. I have been upset by things that have been rejected. Um, but I've never sat down and, and thought, oh, I've had so many things rejected, I'm wasting my time here. I don't think I think like that in life anyway. I think generally if someone says no to something, I go, well, you're in charge. You know what you're doing. Put that one away. How about this one? I, I'm not very, I don't get resentful of people that say no to me. I work on the assumption always they're paying the money. So if they say no, then then no is fine. Um, I've had arguments with people, particularly editors, um, who will say, I want to change something. That's a whole different ball game. And they go, this is a pretty good book, but could you do this, 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 and this? And it goes back to me, we'll go, why? There you go. You know, Gary with the school teachers, why? Right. Um, and, you know, a good editor will say, because, and a bad editor will say, because I said so, and if you don't do it, I'll do it. Uh, um, and I've worked with both of those, uh, luckily never on a book. Um, but I have worked in other things with people that have just gone, oh, I'm just going to change it then if you don't want to change it. And I'm like, okay, don't employ me ever again, please. Um, <laughs> but that out and out sadness of rejection and feeling, no, I, I don't think I could sit down and go, it's tortured my soul um, because I think I've just been ridiculously lucky on quite limited talent. I've been ridiculously lucky that I've never had to face that awful thing of rejection that has made me doubt what I do and made me go, that's it. I'm never doing another one of those because of, I frequently go, that's it. I'm never doing another one of those for other reasons, but it's never been because of something rejection. Um, so I, I, yeah, I have had ideas turned down and everything, but that's quite right. So you should. Um, God, if, if every single thing I'd ever suggested had actually got turned into a book or an audio or a comic strip or anything outside of Doctor Who, I think we'd have some awful Doctor Who out there because, believe me, I might have one good idea every couple of years. I have 10 really awful ideas a week. Uh, and luckily, I've always had people going, no, Gary, you're better than that. Try this something else instead but I don't go away and sulk about it. And I'm very good at, if something gets rejected, uh, I put it in the drawer and say, I'll go back to that in three years time and see if I can rework it. Um, which I've had a couple of, I mean, I, I was commissioned to do a TV show when I first came back from Australia to the UK. And we went, I mean, I worked on that for 18 months, uh, mm -hmm. creating my own show. And I was very pleased and honored to be do, do that. But I went, I had three different producers across that show so it kept changing every five minutes ago we've worked out what it oh no someone else has come in and said oh actually can we not do that how about changing this change that character change this storyline change the setup by the time I got to the third producer I was like mm. <laughs> well, I kept going with it until finally the the studio making it changed their whole policy and my show was one of the things that immediately got cancelled but I didn't sit down and go, that's it. I'm never going to work in television again. I went, I still think this is quite a good idea. And the first producer thought this was a good idea. And the second producer kind of thought most of that was a good idea. It's only the third one that came along that didn't. So put it in a shelf and one day I'll pick it up and go, right, I'll do something else with that. That's just the way I work. I, I can't be bothered um, getting upset. I'm too much of an egotist, really. I, I'm, you know... I'm 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 fragile in many ways, but I'm not fragile over my work. Um, probably because I've been an editor as well as a writer, and therefore your brain goes, well, if the roles are reversed, I'd be furious if that writer behaved that way. 
So I won't behave that way when someone says no to me. Okay. I, but I can be desperately fragile in other things if I want to. Yeah. Be a, quite a tenter tantrum, temper tantrum person. But yeah, um, I have been really, that TV show was, was guttingly um, rejected, really, after the work that gone into it. But I say, I just went, okay, put it in a drawer and one day we'll re find a way to reuse it. Okay, very good. So put it in the portfolio and bring it back. Yeah. I, think okay. all writers, I think all writers do that really is, is if you get, if something gets turned down, the worst thing you can ever do is press the delete button because you will always find a way to reuse stuff. Stuff, I've had stuff in the past where uh, I did a Doctor Who novel and I was probably two thirds of the way through it and I let the editor see it. And they came back and went, whoa, actually, I don't think that storyline is working at all. And it's dragging you down the wrong. And how about you took it out? Was, That's a lot of work. But I went away and did it because they told me to. But I kept it all. I literally was cutting chunks out and putting them into a separate word file. And I have taken that rejected storyline one day. And I used it on a non-Doctor Who project in a bit of short fiction once that I did for someone and it worked brilliantly out of the Doctor Who context and out of the rest of that story. And that's what you have to do. You just have to keep cutting and pasting your life into, into little Word documents and keeping them on a flash drive somewhere. And one day you go, oh, that was good. That would fit in this idea, wouldn't it? Get it out, tweak it, change it, take a couple of weeks to rework it. Bang. Yes, it was a good idea in the first place, but it didn't work in that Doctor Who book and they were right to make me take it out. And now I've done something with it. Ten okay. Years later. Okay. Very good. Um, as we wrap up here, I want to mention two people that, you know, um, author Andy Lane uh, mm -hmm. and his uh, wife, Helen uh, Sterling Lane, um, who I'm grateful to. Um, Andy was an inspiration to me accidentally a couple of years ago when he had written something online about how he was excited about how his first BBC audio novel for Doctor Who was coming out. And he uh, kind of really made me think, how does that feel? How does that feel to become accomplished, to have your name down in Doctor Who and British cultural history forever? It, it really made me wonder for years how that must feel. Now, with you and your career, thinking back, do you recall a time when something that you worked on came out and that you were just thrilled to death, where you couldn't believe you'd been involved in this, where this is really super awesome? When I was little, and I used to go to W. H. Smith's, which is a bookseller chain in the UK, and buy Target Doctor Who novels. It was the most exciting thing in my life was to go and find a doctor, you know, because in those days there was no fandom. So I, you, know, you didn't know when a new book was coming. You walk into, oh my God, there's a new doctor Who book. Ah, I must have it. That was exciting. When Legacy was published, I remember I went home to visit my mum and I went into the WH Smiths that I had spent my entire life buying Target books from back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I walked into that WH Smith's and there was a copy of Doctor Who Legacy on their shelves. I didn't cry. I don't know how not because I was going to. But that was the magic moment for me where I went. The circle is complete. And I took that copy of Legacy and I turned it. So the front cover was facing out. I can't remember. It was probably blotting out pork on else or something like that. But I put it so that the Legacy cover was the top of the thing facing out. So the next person who walked past that shelf would see it. And all I could think was all my life, I'd wanted to be on that shelf in that WH Smith's in my hometown. And there it was. And I can tell you now that I wrote Legacy or the Le Legacy was published in 1994. So 2004, 2014, so almost 30, well, it's 30 years since I wrote Legacy, let's put it that way, but nearly 30 years since it came out. There has never been a book, cartoon, a comic, a cartoon DVD, of all the myriad things I've done, there has never been anything where I haven't walked into a shop anywhere in the world and seen it on sale 
and not had exactly that same feeling 30 years later. Wow. Every single time uh, something I've been involved with goes on sale in a shop and I see it, I still get that same feeling I got when Legacy was published in 1994. Wow. I don't get the years, but I've never lost that feeling of how th absolutely thrilling is it that something I have done is on a shelf and someone is going to come along in a minute and they're going to pick it up and with their money that they've earned, they're going to buy something that I created. I've never lost it. I'm so glad I've never lost it. Um, but every single time I see, even today, I can walk into Forbidden Planet in London on the rare occasions I go to London and there might be four of my books sitting there and every single one of them has me going <laughs> and someone's paid, going to pay money for it. And it's so exciting and it never stops being exciting. And I think as a writer or a creator of any kind, if ever you go into a shop and you see something you did or coded or you're part of a team that did something, whatever, if ever you walk into somewhere and you don't feel that, you're in the wrong business. If you don't feel that moment of excitement of seeing something you did on sale in a shop that someone you don't know is going to come up and pay money for, if you don't have that feeling of pride, excitement, thrill, then you're in the wrong business, I think. Beautiful. I think Beautiful. Wow. Okay. Now, if someone young or old were to be watching this interview or listening to it in the future, somebody that may have dreams I or I apologize goals. to them completely. I'm utterly <laughs> apologetic. Listen to my insane ramblings. <laughs> if so someone wanted to do the things that you've done and they wanted to learn from you by your experience, which you have very clearly explained in a beautiful manner thank you if, if someone were to look at this to learn from it um someone who with dreams or goals of perhaps uh becoming involved in animation being an actor in a movie um being a script editor in anything not just doctor who or torchwood or sarah jane um being a magazine editor being an author um and other things what would it, it, do you have a single piece of advice that you could give them? Never ever give up, okay? No matter what is thrown at you, if you want to do something, keep going, particularly writing, I think. But anything, all I can say to you is I'm kind of proof that you don't have to be very good at it, uh, to succeed at it. Um, but if you really believe that you want to do something, it will happen for you. It might not happen overnight. It might not happen when you're 15 or 20 or 25. It might not happen till you're 50 or 60, but it will happen for you if you don't give up. If you give up, then it can't happen for you because the only person in this life that can make things happen is you and therefore never give up. Okay. Very good. Where do you like to be found online? Uh, I'm on Twitter, um, which is uh, Twilight Streets. I'm on Threads, which is Twilight Streets 2008, because I couldn't get Twilight Streets. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, Twitter is, is, is my main sort of, if I'm anywhere on social media, that's where I'll be. Okay. I'm on Facebook, but I keep Facebook quite private i keep facebook for me is is, is where pe i interact with people who are friends who i know twitter mm -hmm. is where i'm my public me um, okay and usually rude and caustic and sarcastic and and completely no. because no, I'm not that can be i i'm not a rule but i don't stick to rules i'm not somebody who's terribly um well behaved Let's okay <laughs> what does Twilight Streets mean? It was the name of my tortured novel. Okay. Um, and about, I mean, that came out in 2008, uh, which mm -hmm. is why I use that on threads. Um, oh, and 
so it's my, my part of my email address and it's my handle on on uh, Twitter. Um, and I just I was very proud of that tortured book. And at a time when I needed to have a name on Twitter, somehow that just came out. Um, I can't remember whether it was my email address or whether it was my Twitter handle first. I can't remember which way around it was. Um, but yeah, I, it's just, it's quite unique. There aren't, at that point, no one else was called Twilight Streets. There is now um, a, a, I think he's either Danish or Norwegian um, EDM DJ called Twilight Streets. And that's why I couldn't get it on threads. Oh. He's got it. And I only know this because for a while on Twitter, about two years ago, I was suddenly incorporated in a whole load of back and forth tweets from various people about dance music. And Twilight <laughs> Streets has said this and Twilight Streets is appearing here. And I was like, <laughs> no, I'm not. And I, and I, and I realised and I had to say to that it was it started with a, a music magazine that published an interview with this guy. And instead, you know, here's our interview with Twilight Streets. And I had to go to them and say, can I just point out? I'm not <laughs> the MDJ from Norway. Uh, and that you know, he doesn't have that. He, his band is called Twilight Streets. Sadly, I have that. And I wasn't quick enough on Threads. And it didn't occur to me when Threads was launched. I thought oh, I might join that. And then I went on it to try and do, because I've never been on Instagram. And of course, you have to set up an Instagram account to do Threads, uh, to, do, to work on Threads. But I did all that and realised I couldn't have Twilight Streets. I couldn't work out why I couldn't have it. And it was Peter Angelides that texted me at one point said yeah here's why you can't have it and links me through to the dj and i thought damn oh. he, he's got it on instagram and and uh and thread so i was too late so i thought well the year of the book was published as 2008 people like having numbers and things so they can't easily hack it so i stuck the 2008 on the threads version so i'm twilight streets on twitter and twilight streets 2008 on threads Okay. So they're the two places to find me. Okay. That was the most long-winded answer to the simplest of questions. <laughs> I, well, I, you, I just can't shut up. To, to add to that, I was going to say that Dutch DJ must have been awfully fast because Threads just started last week, I think. I, yeah, but I think actually he probably, because I was never on Instagram, so I suspect he's been on Instagram with that uh, name. Uh, so when you set up Threads, it uses your Instagram name. Yeah, so yeah, that, that could have already been taken years ago then, actually. Yeah. So, okay. Um, and let's see here. Do you have a favorite charity, sir? Quite a few. Um, I contribute regularly, well, I contribute monthly to the British Heart Foundation. Um, uh, Terence Higgins Trust has always been a big thing for me. Um, I have done stuff, uh, oh God, yes, I mean, yes and no, I mean, I, I, over the years I have dipped in and out of doing charity stuff in the sense that I have a couple of standing orders on my bank account and every three or four years I change them to a different charity, so there's always stuff coming out of me going into charities, but it varies. Do I have a favourite charity? No. If you really pinned me down and said something, I'd say it would best be something to do with animals. Um, but no, I mean, I, I have done lots of different charities. I, I, I don't have a favourite because I don't think you can have favourite charities. I think if you give money to charities, you give money to lots of charities. And that's what I do. OK, very interesting. I, uh, I agree with you on that. I may have to revise that question. Uh, because I guess you don't have to have a favorite charity. Very yeah, interesting. If you're going to do charity stuff, the chances are you do more than one charity. Right. Okay. If I was going on a TV show, someone said, oh, you know, do Celebrity MasterChef, who's your chosen charity? Then I would sit down and think, well, what am I going to do? That that would be different. But even then, it probably wouldn't be my favorite. It would be right. something that clicked with me at that exam. I'm not saying anyone's ever going to ask me to be a Celebrity MasterChef, by the way. But... Um, <laughs> You know, it would be it would be whatever I was donating to at that given moment, I think. And I say okay. they tend to change. I did the RSPCA for quite a few years. I've done catch um, protection leave for many years. Currently, my money goes to the British Heart Foundation. Um, that will probably change quite soon. 
just because I not because I don't like any of the charities I've stopped contributing to, but I just like to keep everyone getting a little bit of my money. Um, oh. You know, heaven forbid that I should anyone should ever think of me as being philanthropic because that sounds terrible. Um, but I do give to a lot of charities and I, I tend to just bury them. OK, OK, very good. Now, I noticed that you wrote the foreword to a, uh, a fan produced publication, the uh, 1997 unofficial Doctor Who annual yes. uh, with Tarakwius uh, distributing. And um, I had the opportunity. I often wonder how Mark pronounces that, right? Tarakwis. I believe it's Tarakwius. I interviewed a panel of about a half a dozen uh, participants in that, and um, they were excited that you had written the foreword for that. Thank you. Oh, how very flattering. Oh, well, uh, you know, Mark got in touch with me, um, and and he interviewed me about the comic strip stuff with Lee. We did a sort of we did a three-hander or we did back and forth i can't remember which uh and i'm very proud of that comic strip um and then when that was all over and done with he suddenly said you know, do you fancy doing an introduction in a, i think he thought i was going to say no that's like what part of ego do you not understand of course i'm going to say yes and <laughs> i i love these annuals that they've been doing i think they're brilliant i've got them all up on my shelf over there every single one of them apart from the ones that i haven't got like the master one so I'm waiting for them to reprint. Hurry up. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, of course I was going to do that. I think that whole annual thing is brilliant. And, you know, how flattering to me that they, I, I thought from the way they were talking at the beginning that they were having a couple of fictions in there that would involve Stacey and Saad. Genuinely, it wasn't until the annual arrived on my doorstep that I realised everything in it is about the Doctor Stacy and Saad. And I sat there and looked at this, I wouldn't call it a book, it's a brick. You know, if someone wants to burgle my home, I'm gonna hit them with that because I'll kill them. Um, it, it's massive. And uh, it's just full of these two characters I created with Lee, you know? We, 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 we never thought that that would be hanging around for years. And suddenly there's an annual about the Doctor and Stacy and Saad. Couldn't be happier and more chuffed and, and flattered and amazed that that's there. Um, so yeah, so when Mark said, "Will you do an introduction?" and I thought, "Oh yeah," because he's doing a couple of Stacey and Sal things. Of course, I'll do it. And then it's part of this amazing work of art. It's just fantastic. Okay, perfect. Um, All those covers are good. Yeah, there's multiple cover variations. I ordered two of those. Now. I Good news. Only two more questions. What are you working on now, or can you say? Yes, I can. As of today, I can now say. Um, uh, so <laughs> I've just novelized The Star Beast, the first of the David Tennant 60th anniversary specials. What? Um, and uh, obviously, I did it a while back. Uh, and it finally got announced today that, that that this was happening. So it's like, oh, this secret I've been walking around with for six months. Uh, I can finally say, yes, I'm doing Star Well, I've done uh, the novelization of the Star Beast that's coming out January next year, um, which was just amazing. And, and was a result of Russell contacting me. Uh, actually, I think Scott contacted, Scott said to me, how, how, how are you fixed for writing at the moment? And then Russell emailed me and said, look, I want you to do this. And then the BBC books got in touch and said, oh, Russell wants you to do this. That's <laughs> like, yeah, a um, bit like I was with the TV movie one. Um, and again, a bit like the TV movie one, um, you know, here's a script and uh, we're still filming it. Um, so that's been an, a, an exciting adventure for me over the last few months uh, to, to get that done. Um, and I'm just, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. It's the second time I've novelised Russell because I novelised uh, his Sarah Jane adventure, the, the, the one with Matt Smith, I did the novelization of that. Mm -hmm. And of course, at the time I was working with, for him, and it's it's quite daunting novelizing Russell, I have to say. Um, <laughs> you know, 
no disrespect to Matthew Jacobs, but novelizing Russell, who is a mentor, a friend, a boss, a hero, uh, and very occasionally utterly terrifying, um, <laughs> and sitting there thinking, um, I'm not doing the one in the middle, I'm doing the first one. So mm, that's quite a, a, a responsibility. Um, Oh, it's brilliant fun so so brilliant and I, yeah so as of like six hours ago they finally announced it and i was like yeah i can finally talk about it so that's what i've been doing recently um and what else am i doing um i'm doing some editorial work which is quite nice i haven't done any editorial work for a very long time uh, for some stuff for cutaway comics i've written an inferno comic for cutaway comics which is just gone i i wrote it about 18 months ago but um, they've had a big backlog of stuff, but John Ridgway, my all-time favourite Doctor Who comic strip artist, uh, is drawing it as we speak. I've seen the first two pages of that. Um, so I'm quite busy at the moment, and it's wow. nice. It's really nice. Um, but yes, it's the world of Doctor Who. It never, you can't escape it. And now, now I don't want to. There was a period about five, six years ago where I thought I'd had enough of Doctor Who, and Doctor Who, more importantly, had probably had enough of me. And now I'm like, I get lots of opportunities to do lots of new and exciting things. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed doing the novelization. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, who I will kill for pointing this out to me because it hadn't occurred to me, uh, when it got announced today, everyone was texting me going, oh my God, this is fantastic. This is great. Oh, well done, well done. And, and then my friend Andre, who lives in, in Dublin, texted me and went, yeah, last time you novelized a doctor who story it got taken off air for the next nine years I was like, oh. thanks for that thanks. Yeah. that makes me feel great that does um and, and, and i threatened to kill him but luckily he's <laughs> so you know that's across the water and a long way away from me so i can't kill him um but i did think that was really smart and funny and i wish i thought of that one myself um so yeah thing, things are quite nice at the moment Wonderful. Okay. Well, congratulations on, on being able to uh, announce uh, your novelization of Doctor Who Star Beast. Um, I'm, I'm definitely going to be ordering and reading that. I, I want it to be called Doctor Who and the Star Beast, but I suspect mm -hmm. it's going to be Doctor Who the Star Beast. Such a shame. Okay. It needs, it needs an and there in there, I think, on the book, like the old targets used to be. Should it be a DR Who or Doctor Who oh, and no, the Star Beast? Nothing should ever be DR Who. Oof. Okay. <laughs> Nothing should ever be DR who. Okay. No. So so having novelized this uh upcoming television episode or special, I don't know which it's gonna be yet, and I'm sure you probably can't say. Um how how do you feel about that? Is it is it is is that just as exciting as to walking in the bookstore 30 years ago and seeing your name on the novel on the shelf? It'll never go away. Okay. It'll never ever go away for me that feeling. Just wow. the announcement today, you know, and there's not even a picture of the cover because because the cover hasn't been probably done yet. I don't know, uh, okay. but the cover's just blank and just you know it says Doctor Who: The Star Beast by Gary Russell, and I'm just like, ah, oh, that's the most <laughs> exciting thing in the world. I can't. I wish I could. I wish I could flick a switch and not be excited and enthused <laughs> and in love with this. But no, it's just that same feeling. Is it's every time, and is it nice to be able to say every time it happens? But every time something is announced or turns up that my name is on, or I've been part of a team doing something, I still get that exact same thrill and excitement that I got in 1994 when Legacy came out. And I'll be honest with you, I got when Phoenix in the Carpet and the Famous Five went on telly and and all of these things everything that that i've been involved in i'm so damn lucky and therefore it would be wrong to be anything other than excited by them okay that is awesome i'm damn lucky too and i'm glad i got a chance to talk to you um Very because you. thank you so yep. much yep how, how, how do you awful well, how do you how do you feel about the upcoming? I, I think I already know the answer to this. The upcoming three uh, specials with David Tennant uh, and and Catherine Tate returning, and then of course we have the new era with Shuti Gatwa. What are your feelings? Well, um, all I can tell you, my feelings for for, for the David and and, and uh, Catherine stuff is having done Star Beast is 
oh, it's going to be brilliant. Um, <laughs> because it's David and Catherine and they are the dream team for me. Um, and everything I know about Shooty and his series, which I can tell you is about that much, um, because all I've done is seen some photographs, I just think it looks fantastic. But you know, Doctor Who has been lucky since it came back in 2005, because it's had three brilliant showrunners running it. And I say this with no disrespect to Stephen and Chris, uh, but it's the best one has come back. I think Russell is, is probably the greatest living writer in Britain today of television. Um, I think there are very few people that have his vision and very few people that have his amazing talent to write fluffy sci-fi nonsense and tear your heart out at the same time. And that to me is the mark of a good writer, that it doesn't matter what the genre is, the quality of the writing affects you on an emotional level. And I know nothing about the other two specials, you know, absolutely nothing. I haven't seen a script. I only found out what they were even called when that trailer came out a couple of months back. It's the first time I'd ever heard of Wide Blue Yonder and Giggle. Like, but <laughs> Star Beast, I just, yeah, I, it's, it's Doctor Who, it's funny, it's clever, it's gripping, it's heartrending. Um, and it's, you know, written by, I say, the greatest writer and acted by the two best people in television today. I think Tennant is one of the greatest actors ever to come out of Britain. And I've always loved Catherine, long before she's in Doctor Who, I love Catherine Tate, because to be a comedic actor, before you can be a comedic actor, you have to be the very best straight actor, because otherwise comedy doesn't work. Comedy just becomes stand-up other than that. Um, so to be able to portray all those different comic characters in her show back in the in the, in the early 2000s, she had to be the brilliant actress to be able to do that. So to take that and put her in Doctor Who, I, from the moment Runaway Bride happened, I was like, she's amazing. Then when they brought her back for, for series four, I was just like, this is, I said, oh, this is the dream team, David Tennant and Catherine Tate. So to have him back again and, and, and having another bite at the cherry, as a Doctor Who fan, I'm in seventh heaven. It's just going to be wonderful. And then Russell's in charge. It can't get better. There you go. Okay. Well, as a Doctor Who fan, I'm in seventh heaven also. And I don't know what I did uh, to be able to um, have the opportunity of speaking with one of the most legendary, historic, and involved people ever in the entire history of <laughs> Doctor Who. But I thank you. Legendary makes me sound like I should be on, it should be written on a tombstone. I should be dead. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm really not that important. You know, it, there, there are just one of a very lucky group of people who in the <laughs> 90s got the chance to go from being Doctor Who fans to being Doctor Who fans with a slightly higher profile and every so often somebody puts a check in your back pocket. It's <laughs> luck. It's total luck. You know, I'm not great. I'm not ultra talented. I'm nothing special or more unique than, than any of the others um, and significantly worse than a lot of them as well. Um, so it's very nice and flattering that you say that. <laughs> it just makes me feel really uncomfortable because it's not true. You know, I'm not a legend. That's an awful word to give me. Um, I'm just a jobbing writer, producer, who has just been exceptionally lucky. Okay, very been good. At the very beginning, in the right place at the right time. And if it wasn't me, it would have been somebody else. Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Russell. Have a nice You're evening. A star. Thanks, Greg. Take care, mate. You too, sir. Bye-bye.